Good morning, and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church in Lawrence, Kansas. We gather on this day in this curious time in the life of the world and this community and this congregation. We gather at God's invitation to lift our praise and our thanksgivings. It is truly good for the people of God to gather for worship. A few announcements to share with you. This is the last uh, Sunday in the recording process we've been using since March, where we record during the week and then live stream over the weekend. Next Sunday, the 30th of August, uh, we'll start with uh, a more traditional service. Uh, there'll just be uh, musicians and pastor here with a, a lay reader. But we'll be doing that on Sundays at 10.30, You'll be able to watch that live stream, and it'll be recorded. Uh, following that, there'll be uh, lots of communications on how to do that. We'll have that as part of the life of the church for uh, several Sundays. And then our hope is that starting uh, September 13th, as a congregation, we'll begin to have in-person worship, limited numbers with carefully drawn uh, seating, uh, social distancing with masks and uh, some good rules for safety. But we'll, our hope is on that Sunday to begin in-person worship. But next Sunday, uh, we start our live streaming. And today, we're called into God, God's presence by God's grace. So let us prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of God. Will you join with us in our call to worship? You who are many, are transformed to become one in Christ. We, who are many, are called to worship God, the three in one. Let us worship God. Please join me in our opening prayer. Holy God, who revealed to Peter the significance of Jesus' loving ministry, open our ears to hear your word for us and our eyes to see ways you are working among us today. We seek the keys to your realm where all are welcome and freedom is offered to become all we can be. May cheerfulness, generosity, and compassion abound among us. Amen. Amen. Just heard one of the great hymns of the church, I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord. A great affirmation, a rich expression of our hope, our love of God. 
But even as we do so, we're mindful that our lives do not always reflect that love and that there are places in our lives, conduct we engage in, that we need to make confession of. Christ invites us to step into the promises that God makes to us. Do we not realize that all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Our old selves were crucified with him so that we might be slaves to sin no more. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Forgiving God, we confess that we are too conformed to this world. We conform to this world's frantic pace, too hectic to notice all the blessings you provide. We conform to this world's reckless waste, exploiting what you entrust to our care. We conform to this world's shallow values, oblivious to the giftedness of people different from us. We conform to this world's impatient attitudes, preferring the latest instead of the lasting. Forgive our conformity and transform us, O God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the good news. As people born of water and the Spirit who have died to the old life, a new life has begun. God's grace is poured out upon us day by day. Come to the waters and remember your baptism. Be thankful and live as one who has been raised to new life. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 1 to 8. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace of God given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith. Ministry in ministering. The teacher in teaching. The exhorter in exhortation. The giver in generosity. The leader in diligence. The compassionate in cheerfulness.
We're reading from the Gospel of Matthew in the 16th chapter, beginning with the 13th verse. This is part of the continued journey of Jesus' teaching, preaching, healing, and His uh, encouragement of His disciples. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered Peter, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then Jesus sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Jesus asked, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, I have a library full of answers, great uh, explorations of those questions on who Jesus is, who the Son of Man is, how that's understood, full of answers, answers that are balanced and objective. But the text shifts from that exploration of that first question. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? The text shifts in its tone, and in the Greek, it's in the emphatic. Who do you say that I am? I say? Now, suddenly, that balanced, objective exploration becomes very subjective and personal. Who do I say that Jesus is? It really is asking, what does Jesus mean to me? Peter's answer and Jesus' response, Jesus goes on to lay out a journey for Peter in this new community that Jesus is creating, the church. Words and actions are brought together. Affirmations and conduct will have a mutuality and integrity of expression. I have to be honest, I talk a lot about Jesus, but talking a lot about Jesus is different from expressing devotion or love. A better question is, how does my life in word and conduct expre express devotion and love? At different times and among different people, it is easier to make verbal expressions that are not as strongly expressed in behavior. And with others, we find a life well lived that is hard to articulate what love and devotion looks like. How do we have that integrity of word and deed that our stated values are also our practiced values? How does our love, experienced internally, find external expression. Sometimes it's difficult to find that congruity, and we explore it in many ways in our lives. I'm going to get a little help here from Joy and Paul Laird. They're going to bring us some words from familiar musical, Fiddler on the Roof. Golda, I've decided to give Perchik permission to become engaged to our daughter, Hoddle. What? He's poor. He has nothing, absolutely nothing. He's a good man, Golda. I like him. And what's more important, Otto likes him. Otto loves him. So what can we do? It's a new world. A new world. Love. Golda, do you love me? Do I what? Do you love me? Do I love you? With our daughters getting married and there's trouble in the town, 
You're upset. You're worn out. Go inside. Go lie down. Maybe it's indigestion. Gola, I'm asking you a question. Do you love me? You're a fool. I know. But do you love me? Do I love you? For 25 years, I've washed your clothes, cooked your meals, cleaned your house, given you children, milked your cow. After 25 years, why talk about love right now? Gola, the first time I met you was on our wedding day. I was scared. I was shy. I was nervous. So was I. But my father and my mother said we'd learn to love each other. And now I'm asking you, Golda, do you love me? I'm your wife. I know. But do you love me? Do I love him? For 25 years I've lived with him, fought with him, starved with him. 25 years my bed is his. If that's not love, what is? Then you love me. I suppose I do. And I suppose I love you too. It doesn't change a thing, but even so, after 25 years, it's nice to know. The integrity of our words and our lives. When I think of that in response to questions of faith and the congruity of words in life, how does my life reflect the wholeness in all of my expressions? Part of the answer to that comes in God's patience with me, but also in the efforts and faithfulness of other people over the decades who have extended care, nurture, and love. So I'm going to ask you to join with me in a bit of reflection about my past for you to think of them this as well. Teachers of your youth in the school of a community, in the school of the church that I grew up in, Miss Blanchard, Miss Patterson, later Dr. Pate, Dr. Ng, offering challenges, frequently showing considerable patience. They invited the learning that would shape my faith and my life. There were other teachers in many ways. One of my favorites in the 60s was Walter Cronkite. And of course, my parents. And in later years, my wife, our sons, a wonderful daughter-in-law, teaching me about love and life. Others who've helped me to discern my sense of calling and vocation. And teachers present even in these days. And the Jesus that I've seen in people, people in this congregation, in the conversations that we've shared. I've seen parents getting kids up for the challenges of these days in sharing faith and teaching at home. We all have remembrances of the privilege of being in worship with children. And every time we see a child in worship who finds in this space a place of acceptance and love. We've also seen love and faith find the unique expressions in funerals, in baptisms, in the Lord's Supper. Also experience faith in God's patience with me and others as well, for I am still a sinner. And the question comes back, so who do I say Jesus is? Well, by God's initiative and God's grace, I am inseparable from God, and God has chosen to be inseparable from me. God is always also a bit other than I think and more than I think. So I'm reading this week, Colin Morris, in his encounters exploring the Christian faith, talks about this text and this theme in this way. 
Is it not true that God needs human hands to wield the instruments through which healing is done and human eyes to look in compassion on the outcasts and a human presence to stand by the lonely and human brain power to make deserts fertile and feed the hungry and human political skills to fight for a just and humane social order Is it not functionally true? When people say, oh God, do this, do that, do the other, by what agency do they imagine that this will be done? Bolts of lightning? Magical interference with the natural order? God has supernatural agents and ministers of His grace. Well, they seem to be opaque to human eyes. Colin Morris goes on to say this, I find that truth humbling and immensely dignifying because it seems to me that this is a tremendous vote of confidence. It is quite an extraordinary act of faith, not our faith in God, for our faith in God waxes and wanes this way and that, but of God's faith in us, such that God is prepared to commit God's own being into treacherous hands like these, that he is prepared to make a cosmic wager, to take a chance that we will not let God down. Now, that is a one-sided truth, the notion of God's dependence upon us. God is the one who loves me and sometimes scares me. God is the one who asks of me, asks of me a little and a lot. And when I reflect on those questions of who do I say that Jesus is, it prompts another question that comes bubbling up from Jesus' questions. And it is, who am I? Now, I say I am a disciple a student of Jesus' life and teachings. I think the best definition of a disciple that I've heard came from one of the elders at First Presbyterian Church in Fort Smith, Arkansas. This elder liked the definition of a disciple as a willful learner. To be a willful learner, a disciple of Jesus Christ, also compels me to be a participant in the community that God is always trying to create. One commentator on this text, Eugene Boring, says this, Teaching and preaching from this text should point to the church not as a human achievement or fellowship of like-minded individuals who have formed a support group, but to God as the one who through Christ grants the revelation that generates faith as the one who blesses those who receive the revelation as the one who gives us a new name, an identity, a nature, not just a label, and sends us out to continue God's work. So in the presence of Jesus Christ, who am I? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his letters and papers from prison, put it simply this way. Who am I? They mock me, these lonely questions of mine. Whoever I am, thou knowest, O God, I am thine. God's love for us. Wow. Even in these recent days, these past months, I've had conversations with many of you. There have been lots of observations and reflections, many questions, and there have been a few suggestions, and all of that's good. I don't know that I ever heard it, but always in the background was the question, who do we say that Jesus is? Sometimes it is good to ask the question outright. 
it's also good to see the question answered in these most challenging times. We see it in the contact that's made with members and friends by our deacons, in the resources shared with younger members of the church, in the work for justice in this community and beyond, in the continuing efforts to learn and grow in faith and in the practice of faith. We see it in the hope for the future that is and will be discerned in coming days and weeks and months. We see it even in the simple joy of greeting one another in Zoom meetings. Jesus asks us, who do you say that I am? The affirmation that we seek to give would be one that we're Our words in our lives today and tomorrow give good answer to Jesus' question. The Apostle Paul, the reading we had earlier, can help us with this. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, Prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministry, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. This is who we are by the grace of God, and this is how Christ's church is built. Jesus said to Peter, And says to us, on this rock, I will build my church. Amen. Part of God's love for us, God invites us into a relationship where we bring uh, expression to what's in our hearts and minds. Our thanksgivings, our joys, our petitions, our anxieties. Let us bring all of that to God in prayer. God of all, we thank you for hearing these prayers, prayers for the human family with whom we share this world, those closest to us and those whose names we will never know. We give you thanks and ask your help in living into our identity as your children. We pray for members of this community, our extended family and friends. We pray for family we do not know, far beyond us, who have need of your presence. So we pray for the world that we share with all creation, plants and animals we see each day, wilderness that we may have never seen. We give you thanks and ask your help in living into our identity as stewards of your earth. We pray for great needs in the world, in Lebanon, Mali, in this land where fires ravage, hearts are broken, struggles in Middle East, dangers around the world, nations wrestling into being and wrestling with their nature. So we pray for this land, for our local and national leaders and international leaders, that those whose policies we appreciate and those with whom we struggle, that we give you thanks and ask you to be at their side guiding them to act in justice and in mercy. We also bring joys and concerns that occupy our thoughts today, those that we can speak aloud and the many that we hold and ponder inwardly. We give you thanks and ask that you be at our side, that you would guide us to recognize that 
Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And so here, these prayers of thanksgiving and petition that we lift to you in this silence. We give you thanks, O oh God, that you do hear our prayers, that you seek to be in relationship and extend yourself to us and help us extend ourselves to you. And we know all this is made possible through the love that we see in Jesus Christ. In remembering him, we unite our voices in the prayer he gave us as the people of God. And we say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Reading that we had minutes ago from Romans, a reminder that God has given us gifts to share. Prophetic acts and acts of service to engage in, teaching and leading, encouragement, diligence, cheerfulness, giving without strings attached, on behalf of the officers of the church and the larger church. We give you thanks for your good stewardship and care. I invite you to think on how you can express the stewardship of your resources and your life so that freely we may all open our hearts, our hands, and our resources to a world in need. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the measure of faith that you have given to each of us. Increase in us generosity, compassion, and prophetic courage so we may continue to be your body in and for the world. With thanksgiving we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus asks each of us, who do you say that I am? Answer his question, this day and all your days, in every word you speak, with every action you perform. And may God who restores, Christ who calls, and the Spirit who empowers, bless you and increase your joy and gladness, now and always. Amen.